Thank you so much for joining me today. So I want to turn your attention in a moment's time to Joshua chapter 4 as we consider the subject of what do these stones mean. But before we do that, I just want to draw your attention to the PDF that I'd sent to you and I trust that as a family you've been able to download it. It's 10 pages of some creative ideas on how you can use this message uh, and with some fun things that you can do at the family with your children and as a family uh, unit together. So there's a couple of pages on it. There's some things that you might want to uh, consider. For example, I've created some little stones that you're able to cut out onto cardboard and you're able to use them as a reminder of this message. So these little activities will help you remember this message that we're going to share today. So let's turn our attention to the scripture that's found in Joshua chapter 4 verses 1 to 7. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from amongst the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan. Will you turn to your family member and tell them it's from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing and carrying over with them. And put them down at the place where you will stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men that he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. And he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Turn to your neighbor and and tell your family member in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites. And to serve as a sign amongst you. And here's an important point. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You will tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the Lord, before the covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Can we go to the Lord in prayer for just a moment? Father God, I just want to pray for families. I want to pray for everyone that will hear this message whether they're in the family unit or by themselves today. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to understand that there are stones that we need to have in our lives in order to grow as a believer. There are stones that we need to have in our lives as families in order that we will have have, uh, a faith that is so healthy and something that we can actually pass on to the next generation. So I pray, Lord Jesus, would you just bless this time together. In Jesus' mighty name we ask it. And we all said, Amen. You know, children have a fine art of um, asking a thousand questions and they're always looking for answers. I remember as a, a, when my children were growing up, they're now in their 30s, but I remember when they were very small and we were going on some journeys, we would have these little voices from the back um, of the car as they would be asking question after question. And and what would happen is one question would roll into the other. And and as I was trying to give an answer, or or my wife Diane was trying to give an answer, the next question came out. And after a while, we didn't actually know which questions you were answering, as as they just constantly asked question after question. Some of these questions were inquiring questions. Some of them were probing questions. But everyone was wanting an answer. The question I would ask you today, I wonder if your children have ever asked you questions about your faith. Have they ever asked you questions about your faith in God, maybe as a parent or as a grandparent? Maybe guys and girls that are in school, have your friends ever asked you questions about your faith? Is it really real enough um, to warrant questions about it or is it just simply a closed book? You see, I believe the Bible tells us that faith is never passive. In fact, it is demonstrative. It is out there where it can be seen. In James chapter 2, verse 18, it says this. uh, It says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. I will show you my faith. There is a demonstrative action and, and, and part of our faith. There is a living out of faith that is actually required. And so there's no such thing as a silent Christian. I've heard the statement, I'm sure you've heard it, where people say, well, you know, your faith is is a private matter. It's something that you keep to yourself. You don't discuss it. Well, the Bible doesn't give us that. The Bible says there is no such thing as a silent Christian. It is a seen faith. In fact, uh, when we stand before the Lord one day, he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. How can we be faithful if he hasn't seen what we've done? So there is a, a, a demonstrative aspect to our faith. There is a scene of the faith. You see, you and I are the light and salt. 
And wherever light and salt go, it impacts whatever it goes to. Uh, it's never ever neutral. As the containers, the carriers and the connectors of God's presence and power, um, is it just a, a moment in your life where people see God? Or is it a daily encounter of the supernatural? For some people, it seems like we only wait from Sunday to Sunday. It's only like we get from moment to moment. But I believe that what God is saying to us today is our faith needs to be demonstrated all the time. Uh, we have eyes that are watching us. There are eyes that are looking upon us. And they're looking for answers to see whether faith in God is really a real aspect. Or is it just something that we do out of religious uh, necessity? I don't know if any of you have ever um, made bread. I'm sure as I'm saying that, some would say, well, I've made bread. Well, I can remember when I was about uh, maybe 13, 12, 13 years of age, I remember wanting to make a loaf of bread and I got all the ingredients together and I, I, I created the bread. I didn't need a recipe. After all, my surname is Cook, so who needs a recipe? You know that. And so what happened was I made this beautiful loaf. It looked fantastic. I put it into the oven. I'm not sure how long it's supposed to go into, but about three hours later, I looked in and, and the bread was still baking. What happened was when I took it out after about four hours and I tried to cut it, it was like a weapon of mass destruction. There was one important ingredient that I had forgotten to put in and that was yeast. We know that yeast is what causes the bread to rise. Well, I didn't know that. And so what happened was I just made the loaf but forgot a very important ingredient, yeast. You see, yeast in bread alters it, it modifies it, it affects it. Uh, yes, you can have yeast that is present without expression, but that's not the purpose of it. It's there to transform whatever it's put into. And can I say today, moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, uh, today that your faith our spiritual practices ought to be mixed in and knead into the faith and the dough of our children's lives. It ought to be the thing that when we can say the scripture that says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Can our children really see God in us? Can our children really see and taste the goodness of God in us? Um, because they're interpreting what God is like by your actions, by your lifestyle. It ought to be a record of evidence I'm asking the question, is your version of God a good version? You see, the Bible tells me that you and I are really the written epistles of God. You are the living Bible for your family. And I wonder today, as they look into you, are you just a blank book? When they look at you, can they see nothing of God in you? It's just a blank book. For some of you, you've gone through the actions, you've gone through the routines. And so instead of being a blank book, you might just be we'd say a bit of a black and white version. It might just be that you can tell the stories of the Bible. In fact, you're probably very good at telling the stories. But the question is, are you just a blank book or are you just telling the stories or is your life a living full color version? A full color version. That's the version that God's looking for. That's the version that your children are looking for. That's the version that the world is looking for. You and design, you and I are designed to carry the prophetic active voice of God. Not the God who was, not the God who will become or will be, but the God who is, the God who is now. We need to have the now voice of God, the active voice of God in us. Our, our family need to hear him and know him and demonstrate him uh, by our daily lives. As they look at us, they should be able to see a daily expression of God in our lives. Because what you receive is what you manifest. You are there to alter, you are there to affect, and you are there to modify, as it were, um, just like yeast does into bread. So your journey is too important to misstep what God has for you and your family. You see, in the life of Jesus, Jesus summed up his entire mission in two, st in two ver little verses or two um, statements. In, in fact, in John chapter 17, verse 1, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. And then it says there, I have revealed to those whom you gave to me out of the world, John 17, 6. So we see two things, and I believe that's what spiritual parenting is all about. We are to complete the work that God has given us, and we are there to reveal him to those who he has given to us as well. We complete the work 
by living an example. We complete the work and reveal him so that they want to taste and see the same God that we've got. Our spiritual legacy is a legacy of faith. Our spiritual legacy is a legacy of faith. And the most valuable legacy you can ever leave is your legacy of faith in Christ. I believe that the legacy of faith are your spiritual journey markers that you put down. That your family and your children and your grandchildren will be able to observe and they'll be able to take a hold of. And they'll almost be like lights along the way that they're able to see in the darkness of this world. I ask you today, what will be the record of your journey? What are the stories of God in, in, in your journey? What are they like? Because I say today, it needs to be a clear record or testimony of your faith and walk with God. And I believe that's exactly what Joshua was, must have been thinking as he instructed those men uh, to take and choose a rock or a stone. Now, it wouldn't be a little stone. It would have been something big because they had to put it onto their shoulder. And they, and they took it from the dried uh, bed of the River Jordan. What do these stones mean? I believe that they need to be triggers and reminders. It's like mementos. I mean, I have so many mementos of my life. Some of you will have mementos as you look through the activities that I've sent to you. There'll be a night where you can get your mementos out. Maybe you went on a traveling journey and, and you bought some little um, uh, mementos. You, you bought some, some little things from that country that remind you that you went on the journey. Uh, We've got all these things. Why do we have these things? Why do I have photographs of my great grandparents and my grandparents? It's because that we want to remind ourselves of them in our lives. And one of the ways that the Bible uh, was used, or one of the ways that's used in the Bible to remember divine encounters, is they built altars of rocks and stones. Wherever they went, when there was an encounter with God, they used stones and rocks to build altars. Uh, what stones have you placed in your life that your children and grandchildren will be able to ask mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, what do these stones mean? What do these stones mean? You see, some of those stones and rocks may have been placed there out of a battle. Some of us have come through the hard battles of life. We've gone through the hard knocks. Some of us came to Jesus very easy, but others have come through the hard road. For some of you, some of those rocks have I witnessed the glory and the greatness and the goodness of God. Some have come at your lowest moment. You've got rocks that you remember. There's things that you could pull out and you remember mementos that tell you of some of the things that were the darkest days of your life. Some of you will have broken stones and broken rocks. So I want to quickly look through some characters and some examples in the Bible of where stones and rocks were actually used to re remember the place of what God had done, a divine encounter. I think of Jacob as he wrestled the angel at, at Peniel. The Bible says over there that as he wrestled, he was in desperate trouble. We know the story. Go read it for yourself. Read it to your family. And what happens is he's so desperate for God to break through that he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the Bible says that, 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 that he had an encounter, and that encounter, when he walked away, he was limping. Everybody would ask him, Jacob, what happened? He said, I saw God face to face. And how did he commemorate that? The Bible tells me that he stacked a pile of rocks together and commemorated the place. And he said, it was be called Peniel, face to face, I have met with God. What about Joshua 24, 25, when Joshua made a covenant with the people uh, and uh, as he set out the ordinances in Shechem, what did he do? He took a great stone and set it up under an oak tree that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And here's what he says in verse 27. He says, and this stone, behold, this stone will become and will be a witness to us, a witness a witness. Now I could go through many, many other stories in the Bible and maybe you might want to spend some time with your family looking through the examples of where they use stones and rocks to remember divine encounters where God touched them. You see, it was a testimony of God's divine intervention. Every time they put a stone there, it reminded them. They wanted to remember this was a place that God had met with them. So some of the stones were stones to remember. They were stones to remember the memorials to the past activities of God. They were visible reminders of God's activities. How many of us know, how many of you know today that sometimes we need visible reminders? 
In fact, uh, your wedding ring is a visible reminder that you made a covenant with your family member, your wife, your spouse. It's a reminder. Uh, they're constantly reminded. These stones and rocks were to remind them of God's past activity, giving meaning and giving hope to them along the way. Other memorials were there to tell them of God's mighty power in action. And what was God saying? We found, as we read in the, in the scripture from the beginning, it was to be a teaching tool for future generations. For future generations. I'm asking you today, are we leaving them spiritual markers? Are we leaving our children spiritual markers? Are we putting spiritual markers along the way so that they can see the things of God in our lives? You see, for Joshua, he was the same God who dried up the Red Sea, who is now about to dry up the Jordan River. It's the same God. He was active at the Red Sea and he's also active at the Jordan River. He has not changed. And it's, it's not just a memorial, but it's for those that will follow us. Every time we live, we're living so that we're living in the light of eternity, but we're also living so that our family, our children, our grandchildren, and those around us can encounter God because of what we've gone through and experienced for God. I'm talking to moms and dads. I'm talking to grandmas and grandpas right now. But boys and girls, can I remind you, even though you're in primary school, you also have a responsibility that the things you are the light and you are the salt, you are the yeast that affects and modifies your friends in your neighborhood. You are the light that will go out to your friends and neighbors, your, your, your community. Who will they see and do they see God active in your life? Could they ask the question, what do these stones mean? What do these stones mean? You see, the Red Sea was a miracle for the older generation. But the River Jordan miracle was needed for a younger generation. But what they did find was that the God who performed the miracle of opening the Red Sea also opened the Jordan. So all generations, God is concerned about all generations. Do you know that in Joshua chapter 3, the Bible tells us that the Jordan River was in flood stage, which meant it was too fast. It was too far, too deep and, 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 and moving too fast for possibly two million people in their livestock to cross over. But what Joshua does, he tells the priests to lift up, lift up the Ark of the Covenant onto their shoulders and to step out into the water. Just think about that for a moment. Here's two million people in the river, about to cross the river. They don't know how they're going to get. It's in flood stage, the Bible uses those words. But it says that as they're there, can I tell you that it, as they put that Ark on their, on their shoulders, it wasn't about them, but it was what they were carrying. Can I tell you, moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, and, and even guys and girls, it's not about us. It's what we carry. We carry the presence and the power of God. They were carrying the Ark of the, of, of, of the Covenant. And I love what the Bible says, that the moment their feet touched the swirling muddy water, the river stopped flowing and the ground beneath them and their feet dried up. Think about that miracle. It's the same thing that happened at the Red Sea. As they walked through, they walked through on dry ground. What an incredible experience it must have been. As they walked through on dry ground, it was a mighty miracle of God. And it's a moment that should be remembered forever. Now, I don't know about you, if you were part of those children of Israel, and, and the river Jordan and the river, the Red Sea earlier, opens up and you're walking on dry ground, would you say that you'd remember that forever? Well, I, I, I would imagine, and I'm assuming that that would be the answer. Yes, of course we remember. But can I tell you that those children of Israel, those children of Israel, out of two million people that left Egypt, only two of the originals actually entered the promised land. All the rest of them died in the wilderness. Why? They died through unbelief, the Bible says. They saw the miracles. Every day they were given fresh food. Their clothes never wore out. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet they still doubted. They still doubted. And I think Joshua knew that even though this was a mighty miracle that could be forgotten, unless something was used to remind them, it says, be careful lest you forget. And so he instructs those men, one from each tribe, to take a large stone from the middle of the riverbed where the priests were standing 
And Joshua had them build a monument, a memorial from those stones. Psalm 102 verse 18 says, Let this be written for future generations, that the people not even created yet may praise the Lord. It says in Psalm 71 verse 8, and even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, so that your, your might to all who will come. There is a generation that desperately needs to hear the stories of God in your life. Moms and dads, our boys and girls must hear the stories of God. They must hear the living, uh, fresh revelation of God from our lips. These stones are to be your letter to the future. It's to be a testimony even to those around us, your neighbors. And let's be honest, right now we are in the middle of a pandemic. Right now we have so much confusion happening in the world. We have so much chaos taking place that the world is desperately looking for a real answer. And can I say to you today that that world out there, uh, your, your life, your stones that you will put into place will be signposts to the lost. It says there in, in, in verse 24, he did this so that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord is powerful and to all them that fear the Lord. You see, it's been God's plan for all ages that every generation would come to know him. He wants them to be testified to, not just with our words, but he wants to bear testimony from even our actions that people can see us. We have an incredible opportunity right now in our nation of Australia and around the world to actually be able to shine Jesus, shine Jesus and be the salt of the earth to every one of, uh, one of them around us. So what memorial stones will you create in your altar? I want to mention a number of stones right now that I believe are vitally important for us to actually have as part of our walk and as part of our family and faith. Number one, there is the cornerstone. Uh, and the ancient cornerstones were the first stones that were put into a building. And, and they were cut and placed with absolute perfection because all of the walls of that building would get their angles from this one stone. In fact, that stone either made or broke uh, the building. Every angle of the building is matched up to that cornerstone. It is a vital stone. The Bible tells me that Jesus is our cornerstone. Everything in our lives ought to be matched up to him. If we don't have him in our lives and we don't have him as the centerpiece, as, as the cornerstone of our life, everything around us unravels. Everything around us doesn't come to fruition, but he needs to be the cornerstone. The second stone is the capstone. Now, the capstone is very different to the cornerstone. In some circles, the capstone is also known as the keystone. And it is the stone that's in the center of the arch. And what it does, uh, it, it holds the arch in place by withstanding the pressure from both sides. It holds that entire arch together by, by taking and, and putting the pressure in the right place. Can I say to you today that Jesus is not just only our cornerstone, but he's our capstone. He's the keystone. He's the one that holds our lives together. He's the one that life has no value, has no purpose unless he is in our lives taking the pressure for us. And, and I think every family member could say today, we've been under pressure. We've been under pressure for quite a few months, nearly 18 months of pressure. And, and I asked the question, where would we be without the Lord? We need him as the capstone. Number three, he is the rock of our salvation. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. We know that he's God himself and, and he is safe and he's secure and he's a permanent base. But he's the foundation. And, and I want to say today that why I'm talking about the keystone or, or the capstone, and I'm talking about the cornerstone, I'm talking about the rock of salvation, because these relate to the fact that we must have him in our lives. We must be part of our lives. Otherwise, what happens is we fall apart. We have a decision to make. If we've never asked him into our lives, we need to say, come into my life, be the cornerstone, be the capstone, and be the rock of my salvation. Number four, in your family and in my family, we need the stone of God's doing. There's a beautiful song written many, many years ago by Fanny Crosby. In fact, it was a hymn that is, she holds the Guinness Book of Records for the most hymns ever written. 
over 6,000 hymns. And, and the, the, the astonishing thing about the fact that she could write these hymns is that she was blind from a few days old. But one of them was simply, this is my story, this is my song. I wonder if you can talk about the story of God in your life. I wonder if you can be, I'm challenging you today to have the story of God be a fresh story. Not a stale bread story, but a fresh story. Uh, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Is it uh, the supernatural an event or a daily occurrence in your life? Can you say with your family that we are experiencing the stone of God's doing? We've seen God do many things. We found God do incredible things through us. What about the stones of testimony? Testifying stones. The Bible says that if you don't praise him, the stones and the rocks will cry out. Uh, I, I love what the Bible says about the two men on the road to Emmaus, two disciples on the road to Emmaus as they are walking and Jesus comes next to them. They, they, they don't recognize him. They're so consumed with what happened a few days before of Jesus dying. They, they just couldn't get their heads around. And as they're walking along, Jesus comes next to them and they don't recognize him. And then he begins to break the bread of life. He begins to unfold the story. And the Bible says from, from the first books of the Bible, he begins to show them where he is. And as he's sharing his testimony, as he's giving his testimony, the Bible says that they say this, did not our hearts burn within us as he shared his story? I ask you, what kind of memorials do you have in your life? that testify of God's activities. Whether you realize it or not, we all have memorials in our lives. And those memorials are our memories. Uh, memories that, that, that trigger things of places, that, that trigger uh, memories of, of, of people in our lives. It's just like the memorial stones in Gilgal. You see, those were significant places in our lives. And we remember them. We might have photographs. I mentioned a little bit earlier, the wedding ring is a reminder. In fact, uh, if I close my eyes, I'm at an altar. And I remember the place where I got saved 47 years ago. I can close my eyes and I can smell the place. And I can say to you after 47 years, look what the Lord has done. I, I, I thank God every day that 47 years ago, He came and changed my life. I'm at another altar three months later. I'm 14 years of age. I'm at a campground and a word of knowledge is given by a pastor that never knew me, didn't know me at all. But as he, as he spoke those words over me, it was confirming the call of God that I'd had just a few months before that God had said that I'd go into ministry. And it was a confirming word. It was another stone in my life. I think of when I'm 22 years of age, I'm at an altar and I'm waiting for a beautiful girl to walk down the aisle. And it's, can I say it's 39 years this year. Next year is our 40th anniversary when Diane and myself said I do and we shared our vows and our promises. These were special places for me. You know, those are memories of people. I think of people that, that have been so significant in my journey with God. Some of them have long gone on to, to the kingdom. They're around the throne of God now. But I remember them. I remember them. You see, your story is his story. Can I tell you, moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, our kids are being introduced to many versions of Jesus in the schooling system, in our communities. They need to see the real one that's lived through you. They need to see Jesus incarnated, as it were, through you. Incarnational living. That as you live, they see Jesus. And here's a very simple thing. If it doesn't show Jesus brighter, if you can't flesh it out, flush it out. If you can't flesh it out, flush it out. Because anything that will cause our kids and another generation to lose hope and lose faith in God because of things that are happening in our lives. You see, I believe that these stones I'm talking about today, they are, these were physical stones that these men picked up out of the River Jordan. I, I would encourage you today, tell your children about how God answered your prayers in times of trouble. Find those stories. Tell them how Jesus rescued you from your sin. Tell them about the amazing things that God has done. Tell them the stories over and over and over. Every generation needs their stories. Boys and girls, when you are living as the salt and the light, you will begin to have your stories that you can start sharing with your friends and your neighbors around you. Your stories will give foundations to each other. Number six, we need the stones of renewing. 
a time of renewing personal commitment. You see, Joshua not only issued the order for those 12 men to go into the River Jordan where the Ark of the Covenant was and to pick up the stones and put them out. But the Bible says in verse 9 that Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan. He went down personally into the, into the river and on the dry ground, he picked up another 12 stones and created an altar right there in the middle uh, where, where those priests were carrying the ark. And the Bible says it's there to this day. Why? Because he left it there. He wanted as a reminder. He wanted a reminder. It was not just that everybody else has to come right with God, but personally. And can I tell you, it's not just about your mom or your dad becoming a Christian and living for God. Each one of us have to live for God by ourselves. Let me quickly go a bit further. What about the rolling stones? Uh, rolling away those old defeats. Now, it's not those rolling stones. Here's what it says there in verse 19 and 20. It says, On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan, and they camped at Gilgal, on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. Why was it so significant that it was on this day? Do you know that 40 years to the day, on this day, the children of Israel had marched out of Egypt? It was a significant day for them because not only was they to remember what's going to happen here at the Jordan River, but it was also a reminder that 40 years to the day they had come out of Egypt. And Gilgal simply means the reproach has been rolled away. The rolling stones rolled away the reproach. 40 years of spiritual defeat and failure had been rolled away. It was the dawning of a new day for them. Can I tell you today, God wants to roll away all the stones of defeat. He wants to roll away all the stones of despair. He wants to roll away all the stones of past failures because he wants to give you a new day today. What about here, the stone of help? And we find that word Ebenezer, which means how the Lord has helped them. We find this in 1 Samuel 17, uh, 7 verse 12, the fact that God had routed out the Philistines before the Israelites. It seemed impossible. And they said, no, Ebenezer, the Lord has helped us. It seemed impossible. Can I say to you today, don't forget the benefits of God. It says in Psalm 103 verses 1 to 2, don't forget that he forgives your iniquity. He heals your diseases. He has come through for you over and over. Can you say to your family today, God has been my help. God has been our help. When we had no more resources, God stepped in for us. Forget not his benefits. Why? Because it's all about God. In fact, as, as, as parents would talk to their children, what do these stones mean? I believe those stones could cry out, God did this. God did this. They were a reminder that God was with them. I believe we have a mission to show and tell Jesus to our world. We have to show we are existing to know God and to make him known. And that's every generation. Boys and girls from the youngest to the oldest, you can know him and you can make him known. What about the stones of faith? The stones out of the Jordan were, were marked, marking the movement of God amongst his people. They were not just testifying of the willingness of people to leave where they were, but they were willing to move on with God. It wasn't that they were going to have a little holy party around those stones and stay there forever. No, they were there to remember, but then to move on. Can I tell you today, every time God deals in our lives, it's not to keep you there, but to move you on. Every step of God, it's a step of faith. A step of faith wherever you are in God today. He's telling you today, I've brought you this place. Rejoice, but move on. Move on to the things. Because we are facing challenges to our faith today. We're stepping into unknown waters. Nobody knows what tomorrow looks like. We plan today and tomorrow every plan has changed. We, we believe. The Bible's telling us that they were to believe what they could not see. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but can I tell you, I know who holds tomorrow. We can, have not seen what God will do, but we can believe that he's faithful and we can venture with God. So these are stones of faith. There's many people in the Bible. I would encourage you, I think of Abraham. Abraham, as, as he walked, he took some of these stones as he was looking for the city whose builder and maker was God. 
He was in a growing journey of faith. Look through the other Bible stories and accounts where people had to have faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him and they will find Him. It's not to stay there forever, but to move on. It's something that we recall and we rehearse and we repeat and we recite and we remember. Because as we tell these stories to our family and tell them to our children, it builds faith. Hebrews 11 1 says, now faith is. Not past faith, now faith. It's an active faith. It's present. Our children need to know a present faith. Let me come to a close in just a moment. Some of the other stones that you need in your family, maybe today, you, you might need a stone of forgiveness. There might be things that you're harboring in your heart right now that, that needs to come out. And so what happens, you might need to forgive a family member. You might need to forgive somebody who did something wrong to you. And so you could have a stone that reminds you of that forgiveness. What about a stone of God's mercy? Uh, what about a stone of God's kindness or God's provision? Can, can you sit around the family tonight and today and say to them, let's talk about the provision of God. Let's talk about what God has done in our lives. God has been our help. God has been our provider. Maybe it's a stone of healing. There's, there, there's sickness. We know that all over the world. People right now are in desperate need. And can I tell you today, He is still the healer. He is still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Maybe you need a stone of God's power. Or you just need the stone of communion where you want to have fellowship with Him. It's a stone of communion as you come intimate relationship with Him and say, Father God, I want to spend time with you, but I want to make it a memorial. I want to be a place where I can encounter you afresh. What about the stones of praise? When's the last time you praise God for the things that He's done in your family? When's the last time you got up and shouted out the praises of God from the hilltops and told family and told neighbors and told everyone around what God has done? Maybe today you need a prophetic stone. You need a, a stone that will talk about future. Jeremiah 29 11 says, uh, The Lord has come not to, bring, uh, not to hurt us or harm us or hinder us, but He's come to give us a future and to give us a hope. Maybe as you prophetically speak over your children, as you speak over your family, you are prophesying the things of God and the goodness and the kindness and the greatness of God. What about some promised stones? Maybe it's time just to grab hold of some of the stones of God that, that, that just remind you of the promises, remind you of the faithfulness of God. Um, so what do these stones mean? What stones have you placed in your life that your children and your grandchildren will ask what do these stones mean? I believe today God wants to do a new thing in our lives. I believe today He wants to mobilize us as a family. He's wanting that the story of Jesus is your story. I believe today He's looking to make your life and your house a house of His presence and His power. He's wanting your home to be a healthy faith. That, that is not something that's religious or routine and rut, but it's an ever fresh revelation of the kindness and the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. I believe that He's looking to make your house and your home a place of the supernatural. That is not something that happens as an event, but it's, it's supernatural living, a supernatural God doing supernatural things in your life. I believe today He wants to find your home to be that of more of the stories of God, God's stories in your home. Can you spend time about the stories of God? And then finally, it's a home of influence. Because when God is alive in your home, when God is alive in your family, others will want to come to the light. Others will want to come to the salt. Salt draws. Light draws. You are the yeast that modifies. You are the yeast, yeast that, that brings change into other people's stories. Let me close with this last scripture. It's John chapter 10, verse 10. It says, The thief comes but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have life to the overflow. The question I ask as I close here today is this, is your home a story of Jesus or is it a story of the thief who has come to wreck and to destroy? So today as I pray with you today, I want to challenge two groups of people. Number one, you may be a person in the family who has not got any stones of faith in your life. You have not responded. You, you know all about Jesus. You know the story of the Bible, but you've never responded. I want to tell you that you need to have a faith in God today. 
and, and you need the cornerstone. You need the rock of salvation, which I spoke about earlier. It's very simple. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, I admit that I'm not right with God. B, I believe the Bible when it says that God loved us so much that he sent his son into this world. And C, I choose him to be the Lord of my life. I choose him to be the king of my heart. I choose him to be the leader of my life, that he will make decisions. I will guide, he will guide me and lead me. So that is for those who don't know him. I will pray a prayer in a moment. And if you want to pray that prayer, you can pray it with me. The second group of people are those that are in faith. You are a believer. You love the Lord Jesus. But there are some missing stones. Stones that are needed to flesh out Jesus to your family. You have a broken altar that needs to be repaired. And so there could be some of these stones that I mentioned just a moment ago. There could be the stones of praise you might need, maybe forgiveness. There might be the stones of God's mercy. All these different stones that I've talked about, you are needing them in your life today. So I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to pray two prayers. And you choose the prayer that you need to pray. Let's pray together. Father God, I just want to thank you that, Lord, our heart's desire as families is that our children will also serve you. Our heart's desire is that, Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so, Father, I want to pray first of all for those that do not know you, those that may know all about you. They could tell us all of your story, but never having known you personally. And so, Lord, we pray today that you would be the rock of their salvation. We pray that you'd be the cornerstone, that, Lord, as they build on the cornerstone of Jesus, that, Lord, all the rest of their life right now would begin to fall into place. I pray that, Lord, right now as they would pray a very simple prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood so that I can be free of my sin, all my wrongdoings. I ask you right now to come into my life. I admit that I'm not right with you, but I believe that you have the answer, that you are the answer. And so I choose you to be the Lord of my life. I thank you from this moment on that, as I've said, forgive me of all my sin. From this moment on, I am forgiven. I am clean and I am now your child in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for that second group of people right now, for moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, boys and girls that right now who, who, who just have some stones that are missing from their altar. They could be stones of God's help. They could be stones of God's mercy, God's forgiveness. I pray today, would you help us as we bring you into our picture that, Lord, we would not have you on the side, but Lord, just like the children of Israel, they built an altar so they would remember. Help us to have fresh times with you, have fresh moments with you, that, Lord, will become the stones that will be testifying to our family and to our children and our grandchildren and all those around us that God is good. So, Lord, I bless every single person today who hears this message let them grow in their faith and lord let others be impacted because of their growth in jesus and we ask this all in jesus mighty name amen thank you so much church god bless you and i look forward to seeing you in the future blessings upon you and your family bye